How's it going, Future Cannabis Project community? This is Lobster Fam Farms filling in for Peter. And uh, we have a great conversation lined up today with crop steering mm -hmm. and soil systems, something I'm very intrigued in myself. Uh, Michael, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure, Travis. Thanks. Uh, well, glad to be back here on uh, FCP. Uh, it's been a little while. We've had some, some uh, pretty great talks here um, over the last couple of years, and um, I've really missed it. And so uh, for those that don't know, my name is Michael Box. I'm with a company called Sustainable Village. We do a lot of blue mat irrigation systems, irrigation systems of all sorts. It's kind of my specialty and interest. I've been doing that for um, a very long time, a couple of decades of irrigation work in um, all kinds of different fields and aspects. And, uh, you know, I wanted to have this conversation today uh, with a couple of friends here. Um, we have uh, Matthew LaPlante and um, Mason Bryant coming into us, uh, coming to, to join us here. Um, I'm sure some of you mo know uh, Mason as the soil doctor on Instagram, and um, and he's done a tremendous amount of work there. He's kind of an old friend of our company here, and um, kind of helped us pioneer some early uh, systems back in the day, back here in Boulder, Colorado. By the way, Michael, it's Brian Mason, which is confusing because my first name's a last name and my last name's a first name. So yeah, don't worry about it. Absolutely. Sorry, you just caught me. Uh, I, I am aware of that, actually. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm, I'm glad to have you guys here. Um, uh, Matthew Plant is also another mm -hmm. uh, kind of long-term friend of ours. And We've done a number of kind of projects and test uh, kind of uh, experiments and R&D work with him um, when he was in Oregon and now in Vermont. Um, and, and Matthew uh, <clears throat> presents, uh, uh, does a lot of work with uh, soil fertility programs as well. Um, and uh, yeah, man, it's really good to see you guys, um, Brian, Matthew. Likewise. Um, I... Uh, you know, I've, uh, I missed you. Haven't talked to you in a while. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I feel like every springtime things get away from me at least. Yeah. Like Matt and I usually talk regularly, but we haven't, we didn't talk for months. So. Yeah. A lot. There's a lot of new stuff going on. You're, you're super busy. I was super busy for a couple, a couple months and I don't know. I think once you got your irrigation settled in on your orchard, um, maybe you had a little bit of, a little bit of extra time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's this is the first season in, I don't know, probably seven years I didn't grow cannabis outside. And I thought that was going to free up a little bit of time, but it didn't at all. So does that does that feel weird? You know, it's funny because it's almost daily through May and June and even into July. I was like, I could still, I could still do it. Like there's still time. And I kept, I was like tempted multiple times to actually just have a late crop. So yeah, it feels super weird. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's, it feels like there's a little bit of something missing in terms of just my cultivation. Uh, just not having my eyes on plants every day is pretty, is pretty strange. Yeah. But it was an important year for me to take off. I, I had a kid, as you know. Matt's got one on the way, by the way. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was going to say you, uh, you had some some uh, new new uh, <clears throat> distractions or, or uh, demands on your attention. There. Yeah, yeah, new obligations. And then I put in a, I planted seven hundred peach trees. Uh huh. Um, so that was that's also I was like I need, just need to focus and make sure I nail that because it's just a big endeavor. So big it, was, it was smart to just focus. I'm not even growing vegetables. I'm this is the first time I haven't grown vegetables in like fifteen years. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going all in on fruit this year, but I'll, I'll revert back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually in a similar boat this year. Um, a lot less gardening than I'm usually used to. We, we're doing a, um, a, a kind of a big house building project up on, on my property right now. And it's like the whole <clears throat> property is kind of a semi construction zone and it just is not conducive to, uh, to gardening <laughs> as much. And I'm sort of putting things on pause for a little bit this year too. Um, are you, uh, those are all out in, uh, kind of on the Western slope there, those, the peach, the peach orchard. Yeah. So I'm in a Valley called the North Fork Valley. I live in a town called Paonia and it's mm -hmm. great for fruit. Um, all the way from here, all the way to Palisade. Michael, have you ever had Palisade peaches? They're like, of course. You know. So yeah, yeah. So 
Um, we, it's, it's like high desert and we get, it cools off at night and the soils are good. There's abundant water sort of that's complicated. So it's a great place for fruit. And what about you, Matt? Any, any updates you want to give us real quick here? Uh, I know you. Oh, got- yeah. I, well, we just, we moved to Vermont and, um, kind of transferred my business out there and found, found a property with 10 acres and I started breaking that land this spring, but only, only a 10th of an acre for vegetables. And, uh, we're very likely to get a license, a recreational cannabis license, probably in the next few weeks, if I had to guess. Um, but the regulatory board was kind of overwhelmed with, they, they didn't really anticipate how long it would take to review and grant licenses. So it's taken a lot, a long time. And a lot of people are, they're, they're late in, in planting. Uh, well, it's, it's just about too late. Most things are going into flower now, but, um, but yeah, lots changing. I'll have a kid in three months. Um, but the East coast is new and challenging. Uh, there's a lot more insect pressure there than the, the previous spot in Oregon. Um, yeah, that's, that's roughly what's going on. I, I'm still, like I was talking with Bryant, we scaled down on, on probably the amount of clients that we were taking to focus on whatever project we were doing this year. And, um, but we're still, we're still working with a lot of other people. Um, so the title we threw up on this, uh, uh, show here was crop steering with blue mats mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> which uh explain the paradox there michael yeah yeah well you know and and i'm sure matt will be able to dive into this even more but you know um blue mats which are these little guys here um you know there are these ceramic cones they're filled with water they're placed in the soil as the soil dries out <clears throat> this little valve opens here and water flows through, drips out into the soil, rehydrates the soil, and closes the valve. So, you know, they're a really simple device and, um, uh, you know, kind of basic analog tensiometer that, that when built into irrigation systems can provide very, very static moisture levels in soil. So that's kind of their, um, you know, that's their claim to fame. And that's what, you know, is well as being kind of an automated system, automatic watering system, they, they're able to maintain the static moisture level without a lot of fluctuation. And, you know, we see really tremendous results when people implement that, like cannabis plants um, in many circumstances prefer and enjoy and thrive under a constant, consistent moisture level, um, you know, somewhere in that like 100 millibar range when we measure it with tensiometers, the moisture levels. Um, there's been a lot of new techniques that are being pioneered right now or, or developed further, often with the monogram of <clears throat> crop steering associated with them. And, the, um, and, and those techniques generally involve some sort of moisture level fluctuation. Um, so, yeah, there is a bit of a paradox there. And, you know, Matthew's the one that uh, he's the mad scientist behind um, this project. And I'd love for him to, to jump in right now and kind of take the lead on, on this explanation. Sure. Yeah. So I, I guess where I could start is that the concept came from greenhouse vegetable production, where in most cases they're in some sort of media like um like rock wool or cocoa or even peat and they're controlling pr- pretty precisely irrigation schedules and allowing these drybacks to simulate what plants will sometimes see in nature in in the summer or you know you'll see plants in the field and they're they're drying out it hasn't rained in a couple months and that's giving them the signal that they might they might die soon there, there's a, a reducing window for them to make their seeds and finish their reproductive cycle. So you can trick plants into that, that reproductive trigger um, 
indoors or uh, even in the field if if you're under under glass but it's it's something that is done much differently in these rock wool systems than I would do it in a soil system. And like Michael was saying, blue mats are often used to keep a very constant um, saturation in the, in the media. And that will, that that's great for vegetative growth. Uh, however, you can get a better, a, ba a better flower set. If you, I, I was starting to call it crop steering light because you're not, you're not losing the functionality of the blue mat. You're not dialing it back to where the plants dry out entirely. My strategy with, with blue mats is to dial them back to where they're dripping still, but not resaturating the, the entire container that you're in. Say you're in a five gallon fabric pot. That's typically what I like to use. And blue mat will come on, it'll drip, but it won't get that soil or that media to field field capacity and the the benefit of that is you can get that crop steering effect but you're in you're in an organic soil or you can keep it organic or you can you can come in with with non-organic inputs conventional inputs um and you get the benefits of a of a soil system um and also the benefits of that, those steering type systems that you see with, with wool and cocoa. Let's, let's dig into the mechanics of this just a little bit, because I mean, you told me the other day when we were chatting on the phone that you've been doing this, mm -hmm. but I hadn't, we, we, but we didn't have a lot of time to kind of follow up on it. You told me, you told me some of the results you were getting, which sounded pretty significant, but, yeah. um, but what we, uh, we didn't get into was like the mechanics of what what you're doing irrigation wise. So I, I'm assuming you know what's like for instance. Let's, let's just describe the grow a little bit. Is that can we do? Is that where you okay to do that right now? Yeah, let's do yeah. that. Yeah. And, what and, what size containers are we in? Like, let's just start there. I like I like a five gallon fabric pot, uh -huh. and that's the the type of container size that a, a blue mat maxi would work really well in. Uh huh. Um, and these are rooms that are typically in the range of like 10 to 20 lights. Um, there's a lot of, uh, for example, there's a lot of small tier cultivators in Vermont that are, they're dead set on running soil. And this system would work well for that, that scale. So were you one? Oh yeah, go ahead. Were you using a soil, a soil or a soilless mix or what were you, what were you using? No, it's, it's a soil that's close to a coots mix, like okay. some compost. I don't like to run a lot of compost. We, Brian and I have talked about this. I don't know how many hours it compost is more is usually better as an amendment or not, not half of the media, like, or not half of the soil. It's better as if it's like around 10, 20, maybe 30%. It's, um, it's often like really high in, in potassium and, not a lot of calcium. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mix my own soils or I help clients mix their own soils. That way they don't have to pay $400 per cubic yard. Right. Um, so you have some sort of kind of low tension soil mix. Is that? Yeah. 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 It's, and, yeah. It's yeah. Like, there's nutrients in it. So we're not just doing it in a straight cocoa or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this, the strategy with blue mats and, and this type of, your irrigation strategy is to front load the soil. Um, you submit a soil, a soil test, or you can make a base mix, submit a soil test. Bryant does these recommendations. I do these recommendations and you add X amount of all, all your inputs based on, based on that soil test. And that's usually enough to get, to keep the plants going for most of most of veg and sometimes even a couple weeks into flower. Um, How long do you have them in veg? It just depends. It depends. I, I don't like to get plants larger than three or four feet in that, that pot size. Uh, larger soil vol volumes have more room for error. Uh, five gallons is it, you can run out of gas pretty quick and, and a plant will hit the wall. So usually like soil EC will start 
somewhere around two to 2.5. That's, that's a good, that's a good place to start. Cannabis can usually handle that high of EC, especially if you have LEDs, LEDs are heavy. Plants feed heavier on, under these LEDs and these high, um, high micromole grows. Do you, is, are your tents pretty high, like up near 90? I run them a little bit higher than, than like a standard HPS room. So maybe 82 to 84. I don't like to run the grows that are running those high temperatures are also running other parameters higher. So for example, like the high humidity rooms, high temperature rooms that you see these people running they're they'll run a room at, And, and this will follow a VPD chart. If you look at the VPD charts, you run a room at like close to 90, 88, 90, and the humidity will be a lot higher than a room that's 78. Yeah. And they'll, they'll run more CO2 and they'll run high, really high PPFD. The, some of the new led lights like the agnetics or the foes lights, they're putting out tons of light. And these guys that run those really, those really crazy rooms, they're finding that the plants can take higher feed. Sometimes it's approaching five EC in in feeds Uh, or they, if they're organic, they, they top dress really heavily uh, with, with dry fertilizers and water those in. Um, Okay, cool. So we have, uh, we have one maxi per pot. Mm We're in five gallon pots. You got a, so I got like pseudo coots mix going on. Yeah. See a couple of distribution drippers or just, is it just one district? Distri- I, I just use one. And what I've found is the, the distribution dripper from the maxi going across the pot will resaturate and reach the cone on the other end. And you can, you can set blue mats this way to keep, keep the entire pot saturated. And I do that through veg mm-hmm. and then I'll, I'll gradually dial back the, the dial on the blue mat to where the meter is barely functioning. So it's still, it's still dripping when it's dry to resaturate the ceramic cone at the tip of the meter, but it's not saturating the entire pot. It's, it, it, this is something that it's, it's a feel thing. You have to, you have to look at the meter. You have to get down there and look at it and then adjust it. And when you said the meter, you mean the carrot. Right. That, I'm that sorry, the, the carrot. Yeah. So you can also get these, you can also get an aerometer and know uh, the numbers, uh, you know, that correspond to the adjustment on the blue mat. So typically, like, I don't like to approach those really harsh drybacks in these systems. I, I think it makes the flowers look a little wonky. Um, and I also run the lights a little bit higher than than is standard for leds you can run leds like four inches above the canopy um you just have to feed really heavily to to um keep them healthy yeah so um keeping it uh fairly wet during veg Mm -hmm. and um and then transferring are you moving the pots to a different room at that time or are you just changing the light cycle in the same room no, if you were transferring from a veg room, you, you could keep, you could plug the blue mat in during veg if it's a separate bedroom, set it, and then one at a time quickly move it and turn it on in, in a flower room mm-hmm. without removing the cone. You don't want to, you don't want to break the adhesion to the yeah, ceramic. There's a, and there's a few different ways we kind of look at doing that too. One, you, you could shut the whole system down, depressurize it and pull the three millimeter tube out of whatever yeah. connection barb is. The other thing people like to use, I don't know if I have any here. I think I understand. This is like one version of it. There are mm-hmm. these like these quick connects here, oh, yeah. like three millimeters on both sides. Yeah. Um, and then they, they, they can, you can open them. Um, yeah. Totally. And then that's like a, there's a stop on both sides too. So this one's like the kind of more uh, high end version. This is our professional version. Then we have like another one that's only like three bucks a pop or something that are really right. simple. Too, they have a little more a manual valve an on-off valve on them but uh, yeah those quick connect disconnects um, allow yeah. to do that kind of move the pots from veg to flower without uh, breaking the that soil tension barrier I don't it. know how much time is is allowed if you were to just remove the tube and transfer it I've never I've never lost a plant that way yeah um, but if you did if you did move it and and leave it too long and 
had too much water lost from the soil and that, that connection was broken, often you'll only notice it when the plant is wilting. And at that point, the damage has been done. Sometimes right. you, can, you can recover them, but they're, they're usually in rough shape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed. <clears throat> yeah, no, the, the main thing to worry about with those is when you transfer pots like that, because we see that a lot. Like, you know, folks will have hundreds of these sort of things in a, in a bigger facility because they'll be constantly moving pots from one room to another. Um, yeah. even just down the row and spreading them out more as they get bigger, things like that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the real trick is to just not let the, the carrot itself dry out because that's, that's the real danger is when the soil dries down enough that it actually like pulls water out of the ceramic tip. And then you get an air pocket in here. And then that air pocket um, causes the, the carrot to, to not turn on and off uh, as reliably and as, as with as much sensitivity as it as it would if, if it were full of water. Yeah. And the only way to fix that is to resaturate the entire soil, pull, pull the carrot out, replace it with a new one that's been saturated and try and bond it in that in that pull. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I don't remember the last time that that's happened. It's been, I think, maybe like three or four years. Now, Michael, you're saying it would shut it would shut off. See, I thought it would it would be a runaway. Like it, it would, would be a runaway. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it, it would be a runaway. Yeah, yeah. But but in order for the soil to dry down enough to actually wick water out of the carrot, right? You're gonna get you're gonna be in a dangerous uh, level of dry back. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I'm I'm also I should say that I'm also running things through through the line, and I think the situations where I lost plants were it, it was probably a line clogging due to calcium in the, in the dripper or calcium phosphate buildup in the dripper too. Are uh, you feeding through the drippers or the, the uh, well, my, my well water has, a, has a ton of calcium in it and uh -huh. I, I'll either acidify it or, uh -huh. um, yeah. And I, I, I so it's put, phosphoric acid precipitating the calcium. Yeah. And, and I, I, put, I put, uh, potassium sulfate, in my reservoirs too. I, I have to clean out the, the system afterwards, but it's, I found that cannabis is using, uh, and you've probably seen this too. We, I'm sure it's one of those things we've talked about that uh, potassium is like drawn down pretty heavily in flour. Oh, yeah. And there, there's varieties that I, I, I can't find the threshold for potassium in the feed. Like there's um, things in the chem family. They, they're potassium hogs. Yeah, totally. And when you go into flour with high calcium, it's like you, you, you just, you can throw a lot at the plants and eat, yeah. and it's a low, in my opinion, it's sort of a lower risk nutrient in flour because they can luxury feed and selectively uptake it. And if there's, yeah, like the, the too much idea is, is, you know, you can always have too much of something, but it's, it's a bit tough with potassium and flour in my opinion. Yeah. So I, wh where was I going with that? Okay, so we were talking about the steering, the steering. Yeah, we were just, we were trying to get a visual on the mechanics of the room. Which, by the way, I had one more question. When you, yeah. you want to induce a dry back to mm -hmm. push the plants toward a more regenerative state, how much are you turning that, that dial? You say until it's just barely dripping, but what does that actually look like? Is it a half a spin? Is it a quarter spin? Because I've found yeah. it's very sensitive. And once I get it, I haven't used Lumas for years, but when I have, I, I like, once I get them dialed in, I, I don't want to touch them. Yeah, totally. The, uh, if, when you set the, set the blue mat, even a quarter turn is significant. Totally. And people will find that their, their, their watering wand will touch the top of the dripper and that will affect this, the, the setting enough to like see a difference in the soil. It's, I don't think it's more than, than a, then between a quarter and a half turn to get to the point uh, where I'm trying to get with, with blue mats and this, this style of growing. And how long are you, how long are you leaving them in that dry state? Uh, all the way through about week four of flower. Wow. So and then, and then like I read four week dry back. Yeah. And well, it's, it's periodic. So, and this is something that's very, it's very variable in different systems. If people are running a, a hotter, drier room, it's, you're going to have drybacks that might happen in six hours or it depends on how big the plants are too. I, 
in the plant size that I'm shooting for, the dry backs happen gradually over one and a half days or so. And in this like quote unquote generative phase, I'll come in with additional fertility. You can set up a different line, a separate line where you can pump in any sort of added fertility that's dissolvable. Uh, this could be conventional nutrients. This could be something like corn steep is, is one that I'm playing around with, uh, recently. And it's the one I got is an organic, uh, product. And there's things like fish emulsions that you could run through, through a separate drip line too, to keep those plants fed in that small soil. Um, that's small. Oh, we should answer that question too. Yeah. So the, the tensiometers, um, to check the drybacks, there's several options. There's, there's a couple different styles that you can find at sustainable village the the blue mat people and you can get things from meter group there's more expensive meters but um yeah you, you want to you, sh- you you could use an, an aerometer in one out of every 20 pots to see exactly where the setting is um they're they're just expensive and often at this point i've done two or three cycles in like a few different places without aerometers just because people have the feel for it and they know um they know roughly when they're approaching like a, a too dry of a situation i also want to add something on tensiometers which by the way aerometer is just a brand of tensiometer mm-hmm. yeah um, there's a there's a not yeah blue man has a uh, digital one or um yeah there's a digital one we've been we've been kind of in like a real special partnership with Eurometer recently. We're kind of working and do, like handling most of their cannabis uh, work right now. And and I, if we get into this later, I'd love to kind of wrap on some of the shit we're doing with, uh, with Eurometers, not just for their moisture gauges, but with um, pressure switches and, and voltage meters as well. We're getting them to control all kinds of things. Yeah. I want to, I'd love to get into that because yeah. I, I, I'm working on something um, in a similar vein. Cool. What I was going to say is that the, the thing about tensiometers, they're amazing, in my opinion, and they're, they're measuring water tension, the amount of energy it takes roots to actually uptake water, which is different than a volumetric uh, soil moisture probe. So there's these two different measurements of soil moisture. One is what's the volume of pore space that's being, that's filled with water, how much water is in the soil versus how much energy is it taking the plants to actually uptake the water. And a tensiometer's measuring the latter thing. And I prefer that for the most part in true crop steering, you actually want both because the tensiometer tells you when you should water and the, and the volumetric, uh, measurement tells you how much, but in general, for what we're talking about at our scale, I think a tensiometer is great, but kind of what you're saying, Matt, I've used tensiometers. I mean, I've got probably six of them in my orchard. I was just looking out of my orchard. But I, but I always, and, and they're, they're helpful, but I never rely on them fully. Like, I just think getting a feel for the soil is way better. Um, yeah. I, I, I use a soil probe that I would use to like pull a soil test and I grab cores of soil that go, you know, 12 inches deep. And that's much better for me to actually feel and look at the soil. Tensiometers, the other issue is um, they, it depends on the depth. So so like the thing about tensiometers is I think to do it right, you want to have one at the bottom of the pot if you have a big pot, I guess, and further up. Um, I often find that the measurement's too deep and I'd rather keep my top two inches consistently moist. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. Um, Yeah. And and often the range of the eurometer I think is off for even their low tension tensiometers, I think – I would, I would like more sensitivity in tensiometers personally. In what, in what just, I mean, I know we're getting off topic, but in what range? Cause like, uh, just for some, you know, some pretty familiar with both those devices, the, the blue mat digital ones, they'll measure in millibars, the, mm-hmm. and all of the, you know, and they'll, I think that meter goes anywhere from like zero to, I don't know, 400 or 500 uh, right. millibars. But the, and then the, the rometers have two versions. Like you mentioned, there's the low tension and the high tension. And the low tension, which is the one that's oriented towards measuring moisture and potting mixes and, and soil mixes that have a lot of organic material in them uh, <clears throat> that most people are using when they're growing cannabis in containers. Those, uh, 
those are measured in centibars, right? So, um, or kilopascal, yeah, or kilopascal, but yeah, so millibar, centibar, it's like a metric thing 10 millibars to one centibar. And I, and I, what are the, the low tension ones go up to like 60 centibars, I think. I want to say something like that. Is it 30 or 60 centibars? I don't I mean, have that. That sounds good to me. I, I, but I'm getting the units confused now. I feel like I need to go actually look at one. Um, yeah. I, I guess my complaint, at least, and again, we're talking soilless media here, but in real topsoil, it's always reading zero. And it's like, but that's six inches deep. And I'd rather have the, the, the top two inches much more moist um, anyway. So it's, it's, I think there's a depth issue for sure. Especially, and also, you know, I still work with a lot of people who grow in big pots, like six plant, 12 plant people and 200 gallons. And the, the moisture difference between top and bottom is significant. And so- yeah the depth of where that tensiometer is reading is everything. So how I have uh, people do it is stick one in the bottom, put one in the top and you can shove them through fabric pots or cut a hole and, and see where moisture is down low. Um, yeah. Michael, to answer your question, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to like go look at my tensiometers and, and look what the optimal range I think should yeah. be, but I think it should be more sensitive. Um, yeah. I think, I think the aerometer gauge could be more sensitive too. Honestly. So, uh, what was the original was question, Michael? Um, <clears throat> Sorry, what? Oh, the we were we were just getting to the ranges that, uh, and we should cover this. People are probably curious. There was a, yeah. A let's let's finish up this and yeah, this 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 idea of uh, blue mat crop steering or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah so, with, so right now, like you're in veg, you're holding it. I'm guessing kind of I'm kind of on the wetter side, probably in the like sixty to eighty millibar yeah. zone or, or lower lower than that. Yeah, like maybe forty two. Right. So which would be like four to eight centibars, um, just if we're depending on which you know. Uh, gauge we're looking at, but it, you know, the millibars are um, as sensitive as we're going to get. So you're keeping it pretty wet, closer to 40 millibars. Then you're going <clears> to <throat> uh, move the pot into your flowering room. Right. And, uh, and then at that right, the beginning of that time, you're going to tighten up the dial on the top of the carrot is what you're talking yep. about. You're going to yep. tighten that um, <clears throat> little adjustable dial. It's going to change the moisture level. Um, yeah. And that's why it's, what do you, what's your guess that you're drawing it back to like 120, 140, or even drier? It, the, the measurement will, will differ depending on where the sensor is. If you're using a tensiometer, it'll differ depending on where it is in the pot and yeah. the blue mat's still functioning. So it's dripping on one end of the pot. The sensor has been stuck in on the other and is going down towards the drip cone on the other end of the pot. And if the sensor is close, I, prefer it to be close to the, the actual blue mat cone. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so the, the digital meters, I would see readings on when I was first experimenting on like what the thresholds were, it would be like with the, the, uh, the digital ones, I think I would see readings of like 120, 130 and the analog erometer only goes to a hundred. I don't like to do really hard drybacks. I think anything below below 100 would be appropriate. Something like eight, the, in the 80 range on the aerometer. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh no, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm yeah. 80 80 as the dryback is what I mean. Yeah. Okay. So 80 millibars. Yeah. Which would be like what the blue mat the the digital one measures in. Uh. Or 80, 80 kilopascal on the, the that would analog be, that'd be, that'd be pretty dry. I mean, 800, that'd be 800. Um, we should verify that, I think, later. I'm going to talk about that. because there, there's, also, there's also ranges that university extensions give for crops, like vegetable crops. Uh, Oklahoma State has a good extension page that you can, you can go on. They'll explain what matrix potential is, the difference between matrix potential and osmotic potential and then they'll show their they'll show visual representations of what dry uh what a dry soil looks like in between the particles and also there's there's a graph that shows different ranges for things like cabbage and corn and beans they don't have hemp on there i think the last time i checked right yeah um i did see that note there and i mean that guy's right the Kilopascal is the same as a centibar, mm -hmm. which is, is equal to 10 millibars. And yeah. 
digital one that measures in the millibars. We keep kind of jumping back and forth between units of measurement. So it's getting a little. Yeah, I should, should have just stuck with one. one yeah. meter. I know. Um, but uh, the idea is you're, you're drying it back significantly, but you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're giving it enough moisture to keep the plant alive. Um, is, is that correct or is it? Yeah. 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 And I, I also have uh, a Taros 12, but that doesn't, that doesn't me measure matrix potential. It's just a, it's a soil moisture meter and an EC meter. That's like a volumetric meter. Yeah. And to answer a previous question that was asked, I think about five minutes ago is that you'll see EC spikes as the soil moisture goes down. And, and with that meter, it's, it's, it's a really accurate, it's an accurate meter, but I think the accuracy depends on the adhesion of soil to the, the actual prongs that are sticking in the pot. So I've seen, I've seen EC readings with that meter that were crazy, like 40, 50, 60. I, it's pore water EC, which differs slightly from the EC rate or the, the EC that you get from like a, like a Hannah meter. Um, but I don't, trust it i if if it's more wet i think the the reading is more accurate mm -hmm. interesting so i guess we uh, maybe we could field or should i is there anything that i missed or should we field some questions before we move on to the next topic just just the just the one i want to the like piece of the mechanics i want to talk about too is and you sort of alluded to it but um you know, and we, we, we see this in some bigger commercial systems that we're doing that are a little more cutting edge um, is that they'll have a blue mat um, or sometimes they'll use capillary mats to accomplish this, but have mm -hmm. something that's keeping a really base level moisture in the soil enough to keep the plant alive. And then there's a second, there'll be a secondary um, irrigation system, often some sort of like higher flow drip system mm -hmm. that will be in each pot. And that's used to deliver kind of these, these shots of, uh, nutrient dense uh, liquid feed yeah. to the plants, and then 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 you can kind of pulse in those feedings um, and get them to get the plants to uptake large amounts of nutrients uh, because they're kind of dried out and starving for that. Yep, uh, for that liquid uh, liquid love. There is mm -hmm. that is that is that what you were doing? Also, did you have a secondary? Yeah, liquid? but I'm not I'm not feeding nearly as often as yeah. the rock wool or cocoa guys are feeding. Sometimes they get up to I eight, 10 feedings a day. Yeah, no, for sure. yeah. I was only doing one every two days. That's just the conditions of my room didn't dry the plants out um, sooner than that time frame. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, you know, we do is we do a lot of design work over here um, besides just like selling parts and everything. And um, a lot of our design work we do for free. If anybody's interested in any kind of free design work, you know, you just go to sustainable village and you fill out the, uh, quote request form there. Um, but we've been, we've been doing a lot of different, like, it's really, it's really cool being in this situation where we're, we're designing the systems that people want to grow. So they want, they have goals and desires and things like that. We have a lot of living soil clients and we do tons of blue mat work for that, <clears throat> but we're doing uh, quite a lot of, of just more traditional drip irrigation systems um, for large outdoor fields, but also in these indoor facilities that are using like complex arrays of dosatrons, complex fertigation systems, and um, are putting out, they have, like the drip emitters are really high flow drip emitters, like up to like six uh, gallon per hour drip emitters, you know, that are, which is, which is a high flow when you have one of those on every pot in a room of hundreds and hundreds of pots. Um, so yeah, we're really kind of watching, you know, at like from the position of, hey, designing what people want to grow, this is what we're starting to see people want to design, uh, want designed more, um, especially for, you know, in the kind of synthetic crop steering way of growing. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, that hybrid system has been really interesting to watch take off where we're maintaining that low level, uh, you know, moisture level with a, with a blue mat carrot in each pot or using, uh, the capillary mats to just have like a very low level base level kind of moisture that there is being provided. Um, and then, and then shooting in, uh, uh, multiple feedings per day, uh, with, a, with a nutrient mix. Yeah. And I, I don't think that the types of yields that you see with rock wool and cocoa and synthetic nutrients are unachievable from like an organic system. I think, 
Uh, the, the best I've seen so far with the system I described was three, uh, almost 3.8 pounds per light per thousand watt LED fixture. And that equated to about 75 grams per square foot. And you can do this with conventional feeds or you can do it with organic feeds. And this, uh, this benchmark was with, I should say it was with wedding cake. It's, it's a production plant. It's, it, it's run still by a lot of people, even though it's an older cut. That's excellent. That yield is excellent. So yeah, and, and the quality, that point, the quality you're is too. 3.8 pounds per, per light Yeah. Uh, with this technique. I, I should say it was a Foes F1V fixture, and it wasn't run at 1,000 watts for the entire, the entire cycle. I think it was turned down to 700 for the last, like, three or four weeks. Yeah. Try, we we're trying to get the room. We we're trying to get the room cooler and try and bring out some color in the flower. I mean, in my opinion, you when if if you push yield beyond that, you can also you can start to lose THC potency. Um, I've heard I've heard that from like Rockwell guys over like a hundred grand. Like the potency gets all screwed up. The plants get kind of the assimilant balance gets somehow messed up. Yeah, so that yield is like. The, the upper ceiling, in my opinion, before you start to screw up other things about the plant. I, the, the, the way the flowers looked is also something that I shoot for. And it's, it's not just, it's not, it's more than just an aesthetic thing. Um, it's an ease of trimming. So say you have a flower that has those, those knobs coming off of it, that becomes a more difficult flower to trim which ends up being increased processing time, increased money spent to get it in the bag in the store. Totally. I think that's huge. And I've also heard growers talk about just in terms of like growing for that purpose, if you de-leaf too heavily, you start to get more leafing out of the buds. And that's just, again, more time, more cost. Yeah. Have you seen that at all, Matt? Well, that could also be poor, poor control of their irrigation. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, could be nutrition. It could be nutrition. It could be, um, plants being too close to the light without adequate feed to support that, that light intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, these are, I can't provide figures for these are, these are speculation, but it, it makes sense. And I kind of want to just jump in and just, just kind of like frame crop steering a little bit more, because I feel like what you're getting to in, in, all of these different variables that could be affecting that phenomenon is balance. And essentially plants are maintaining balance. They're maintaining energy balance and water balance and uh, photosynthetic compound balance and nutritional balance. And crop steering is essentially taking, you know, we, we have so many things we control as growers. There's different toggles and we're, we're sort of changing the balance of these different things. And when you, it's all connected, you know, the energy and the water balance is connected. And so when you change one thing, let's just say light intensity or relative humidity, everything else, there's a cascading effect across the plant and everything else changes. Everything else has to adjust to maintain balance. And so with crop steering, we're talking about crop steering specifically with irrigation, but technically crop steering would be, you know, if you're going to the max trying to steer a plant, um, you're, you're measuring as many things as a sensor can measure from, again, leaf surface temperature, CO2. Um, if you're outside, you're, you're, you're monitoring wind and, um, I mean, everything, day length. And then you have a, because if you, you can't, you can't actually control anything or change anything unless it's being measured. And so the, the sort of the best people who have studied this the longest, we were talking about this earlier, Matt, are the Dutch in the Netherlands and they're, they have these controlled environment greenhouses where they're growing mostly vegetables and fruit and they, they are measuring everything and they're steering everything. It's not just irrigation. It's like, I mean, every single thing they have control over they're they're toggling it and trying to change the balance of the plant to make it do a specific thing for production goals. So what you're speaking to in terms of easier trimming is also a way to steer a plant. It's not just yield. It's not just terpenes. It's not just THC. It's also, it's whatever you you're trying to do to achieve your production goals. And so I think crop steering is super cool. And I, I know the like kind of indoor rock guys have really 
um, especially people using like Arroyo systems, like they're, I feel like that's the strongest crop steering community right now, but you can crop steer on in any system on any level by just measuring something and then changing it through the cycle to achieve a, a goal. Um, yeah. I feel like that's, I feel like the crop steering is thrown out in my, as like a buzz, a buzzword right now. And I feel like there's very little context yeah. about like what it is. So anyway, that's why I want to chime in there. That's how I, that's how I define it. Totally. And I, I think the, it, it came into the cannabis scene years ago, five or six years ago. I can't remember. And I, I should name drop uh, Josh Newlinger. He's, he's someone you can follow on, follow on Instagram. And I think he was the first to start introducing this to, to the cannabis, the cannabis world. And he learned it from, I think he learned it from tomato production. Uh, and he was working with Arroya and these, these guys that do this process in, rock wool and cocoa and that's their main method of cultivation are they're utilizing every tool in the book they're, they're gathering an impressive amount of data and um, they can tell you more specifically the types of targets you're looking for in those medias and, and, and we more know, oh sorry to interrupt you go ahead yeah go ahead i was just going to say in turn the other thing i'm realizing is there are kind of targets like michael you threw out a hundred. And I think that's like a great mill bars is a great place to start. Yeah. But, but I think the key with crop steering is, is first you measure it and you don't even aim for a target. You just, you, you run a cycle and you measure it and then you start adjusting and you see how the crop responds because there's so many variables in production, even indoor, but especially like, you know, outdoor production, there's so many variables that I think it's the best approach in my opinion is first measure it then change it and see what the effect is. And you, and you sort of chase, you sort of chase the effect instead of just everyone targeting a certain level because every operation is so different, you know? So yeah. that's kind of, I, I don't know. I, I feel like in terms of how I would approach it is like on any farm, outdoor, indoor is like measure it first, get the sensors, make a change like you did, Matt, see what the effect is. And then you establish your own internal target for what you're trying to do. Right. It, this was, this was happening before these, these meters were being used in cannabis. They're the guys that were growing in Rockwell. They were aware of the effect of a dryback on their, their yields. They weren't uh, some, some people would run their Rockwell pretty wet the entire cycle and you can still pull off decent crops that way. Um, but you don't get that, that generative effect and you don't trick the plant into making more flowers. It's, it's the concept. That concept is pretty simple. How detailed do you want to get with the data gathering is up to you, up to, up to the system. Yeah, totally. The other thing is like, I, I, I haven't dove into this. I mean, it's, it's infinite and there's this book I was going to, there's, there's this book called plant empowerment. I got it out and it's, Again, it's written by three, uh, three guys from the, from the Netherlands. I can't pronounce their names mm -hmm. and it's incredible. Like the, to me, this is from what I've seen, this is the Bible of crop steering. And it, it just, it talks about those, the balances within the plant and how different toggles will change, will have a certain effect on the plant. And what we're talking about is like one of the most, um, important and one of the most fundamental, um, but there are so many, there are like an infinite number of like day length and, and EC, CO2, light intensity, relative humidity. Again, it's just, it's infinite. They probably like, explain it was interesting going deep. Yeah. This is the book, but it's like, I wouldn't just buy this. I would say you want to be able to commit, like if you want to commit six months to study one subject, then get this. I wouldn't just dive into it. You know, so, I, I got a question for you guys. When we, we talk about the crop steering and, and drybacks and things like that, that comes up a lot is, is just around the kind of microbiological activity in the soil or the populations of the microbes in the soil. And are they being um, injured by, by these drybacks? You know, one of the things we, we kind of talk about a lot with blue mats is in uh, like that static moisture stuff we've got into is like, Hey, one of the big advantages we're maintaining this really, um, kind of, you know, static moisture level, 
there's like this kind of uh, hydro neutral state where a lot of these microorganisms prefer to live in, like a not too wet, not too dry kind of zone. Mm -hmm. Populations tend to explode in those conditions. Um, <clears throat> so where's there, there must be a threshold, right? Like where we're losing productivity because we dry down enough and <clears throat> we're losing, if we're relying at all on uh, the, the, the mi microbial activity in the soil, um, all those beneficial bacteria and fungi and, and, and uh, you know, other organisms, you know, what's, what's that threshold where we're drying it down too much just kills the biology of the soil. Short, yeah. Short answer is I, I don't know. And I, I'm sure there are, there are different species that are more tolerant to a dryback than others. If we're talking about bacteria and how, uh, whether or not they're able to go into a dormancy or they outright die. Um, I don't measure that in my soil, but the other thing is that I'm not going for the, the same hard drybacks that the other styles in, in soilless medias are, are trying for. And this period of, of milder drybacks happens just the first part of flower in three or four weeks. And then the blue mats turned back up again or opened up again, and you're getting close to close to a more saturated media, which is what the steering guys do anyway. They, they run, they don't, they don't do hard drybacks for the entirety of the, of the flower cycle. They do it for the generative period, three or four weeks. And that's something we didn't really kind of jump in there or we didn't like kind of finish up okay. with, with that, with that. Yeah. Nice guy. He is amazing. I agree. What a guy. But uh, Kyle knows me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he, uh, uh, you know, that, that is kind of that final step, right? Is actually like, so that first kind of four weeks of flowers when we're really pulling the moisture level down. And then for the, for the second half, essentially, you're, you're bringing it back up to like the near veg moisture level or maybe not quite yeah. as wet. Yeah. I yeah. Said, and I say, like, oh, go ahead. Yeah. You go ahead, Brent. Right. I was just going to say, I kind of have some opinions on that. The quite your question, Michael. Yeah. The, the first is that microbes can persist in very dry conditions because we're talking about moisture in the pore space, but they're at least in topsoil. And I'm assuming with soilless media as well, whether it's peat or, or compost, there's still a lot of moisture that's tied up in micro pores that, that plant roots just don't have access to. So for example, the, the, the pore space in a clay heavy soil still has water in it, even if those plants can't access it. And there's also microfilms of water on, on soil particles. And there are microfilms of water in every little nook and cranny of a, of a soil complex where microbes persist and live. And then dormancy. The other thing is a lot of these species can go into dormancy and come right back out of dormancy. Right. And, and like they're, they're, I mean, to me, microbes are not fragile and we, and we shouldn't necessarily treat them like they're super fragile because at the end of the day, like our goal, even though I, I think a lot of people growing in soil are, are biological growers and they want to maximize biology, that's not the actual end goal. The end goal is a really, really healthy crop. So right. to me, the goal, the, 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 pretty much the sole purpose of microbes is nutrient cycling. Yeah. They're just recycling nutrients into plant availability. And there are biostimulant effects from their exudates and things. But at the end of the day, if the nutrients are available to the plant, water, CO2, sunlight, that's what creates high quality genetic expression. And so I don't think we should necessarily manage our moisture for microbes because they're going to be there no matter what. They're, they're going to be there, but are they going to be as active? Or are they going to be doing their jobs? I, I think my belief is that they measure. are. And I think that like, if you, like, for example, if you felt a soil and it felt bone dry, that soil volumetrically is still like 40% water content. So like a bone dry soil is, is still that the volumetric reading is still 40%. So I think there's plenty of water for the microbes. It, it depends on the soil too. So like clay, like clay will hold a lot more water than sand. Totally. And then there's every gradation in between. And, and that's where the soilless media. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, that's, that's a, that's an open question for sure. But yeah, I mean, I, even in soilless media, like if you, you, it can feel dry and, but if you squeeze it hard enough, you know, you can get water to drip out of that stuff. So, right. It I, I would admit compost heavy or not, but compost holds a lot of water. And, yeah, I, totally. and I think also there's a differentiation here between like, you know, 
kind of uh, like perennial native soil crops or, you know, full season outdoor crops that are in native soil versus things that are trying to flower and, and finish in, in like a two month window when there's right. a lot of, a lot of energy needs to be kind of really driven into that plant very, very quickly. Right. And they need all their resources at hand. So there is, yeah. some, there's probably some sort of balance point between those two styles where totally, you know, that kind of threshold again of like, where does it make sense to have more dryback or allow more, allow more dryback uh, lie? So if we're doing a small container grows or even just like in rapid succession, raised bed grows under lights or mixed light applications, um, we need more microbial activity kind of available to the plants for that nutrient cycling process you're talking about versus, yeah, totally. versus an orchard, you know, which, which well, is good. Yeah. And, I, and I'm even thinking the system that Matt's running versus maybe like a a, a bigger pot with layers and that's like that people are super relying on very efficient microbe cycling is different than like, I mean, Matt's feeding every other day. So like those plants are getting soluble nutrients. So in theory, yeah, or at, at least suspend if you're, if you're going with like organic inputs, well, right. suspendable. Suspend. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, like they're getting ions in solution. So like, the role of the microbes is diminished and that's yeah. and I'm not trying to diminish, you know, biological farming and biological inputs and maximizing microbiology, but we're growing, we're talking about growing in peat based medias in five gallon pots. And I think that, and I've been saying this a lot lately, like we're already outside of the natural environment to a certain extent. So like, of course we want to, we want to maximize microbiology, but not at the expense of, our, our production goals. Totally. Yeah. Sure. And I guess one indicator that would suggest that the microbes aren't taking as big of a hit as people are worried about is that when you run organic inputs into the, into this type of system, the, they're still feeding the plants. So a fish emulsion, something that has like a, that has a protein nitrogen source or amino acid nitrogen sources, like the plant isn't going to absorb a protein. So that, that feed is going to get put into the soil and a bacteria is going to make it, a, it's going to turn it into nitrate and then the plant's going to take that up. So if, if this system really killed bacteria, that conversion wouldn't happen. Exactly. And I see that all the time on soil tests in bone dry soil where you, I've, and I've done this, I mean, you amend a, a dry yeah. soil, you let it sit for three weeks, you send it out, the ammonium is zero or one. And the nitrates 150 ppm. So the microbes yeah. mineralize that nitrogen in a dry environment. Yeah. So it's it's just a it's just a midway. It's a strategy in between the the fully saturated soil systems that you'll see in like larger soil volumes and the the types of like really common commercial uh, steering strategies that you see with uh, rock oil or cocoa. The, the other thing is the pore space isn't very high in microbiology. In microbiology. Like the rhizosphere has a thousand times more microbes, which is within a millimeter of the root. So like, I think a lot of the pore space filling with water is like that that's, that's for the plants, you know, it's not necessarily where the microbes are living. Yeah. Yeah. Should I'm not saying that, that I think your theory, Michael is correct in general, but I don't think it's significant enough to change any kind of management decision. Yeah. yeah. Should, should we jump into field application? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? No, I'm you... up for whatever. I mean, I'm up to go wherever you guys want. We could keep talking crop steering. I mean, I want to hear what you've been up to, Brian, because, like, again, we just don't get to catch up as much. Yeah, as totally. Yeah, yeah, this season, um, the majority of the time this year, I put in this really advanced irrigation system. That's what I've spent, I mean, most of the year doing. I got funding from the the NRCS, it's a, it's a, Oh yeah. We work with NRC. I was just on the phone with the, their uh, Fort Collins branch yesterday. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. We've been, yeah. we've been working with a bunch of NRCS projects actually. Yeah. So I got a big cost share. I went into a, a contract with the federal government, yep. which I like was, I, I, I couldn't sign it. I was like, do, should I do this? Um, but it's been awesome. So oh, I put in this awesome. irrigation system cool program as far as, as yeah. far as federal programs go. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. So I put in this irrigation system, with a seven and a half horsepower pump. And I broke my farm into 11 zones, essentially. And each zone has a, a valve uh, with a solenoid. And I, I, I buried wire. I buried almost, 
a half mile of wire to every single uh, valve. Mm -hmm. And I put in a big header line and in my orchard, I put in micro sprinklers. Um, in my pastures, I put in overhead Nelson sprinklers. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a high tunnel zone, a uh, future cannabis zone. I've got all these different zones set up. And I essentially installed this massive irrigation system and um, all of it, all the wires come back to my pump station where I'm going to be setting up a data logger. And then I'm going to have all these sensors kind of continue our conversation about crop steering. I'm going to have all these sensors around my farm and yeah. those are going to uh, take data. And it's not just soil moisture. It's going to be everything that I can measure. Um, and I'm going to upload that data to the cloud with telemetry. And then there's this software through a, a company called Campbell Scientific, where you can program your um, your irrigation to do whatever you want. So I'm essentially going to program it to turn on at certain moisture levels and turn off when the lower sensors, you know, sense moisture. Yeah. Um, that last stage I haven't done yet. I've just have the wiring and I have the switches and I, I actually have the data logger. I can show it to you. It's sorry. It's all wired. I take it back. It's, it's on the floor, but I can't pick it up because it's attached to all these wires. Um, so I've spent like most of the year, setting up irrigation. And then once the irrigation was set up, I planted the, the 650 or 700 fruit trees. Um, and I've just been obsessively keeping them alive and feeling, I mean, just farming. I cover cropped the last two years. I prepped the field and tested the soil and amended the soil. Um, I planted a, an alley crop between the trees and I just obsessively irrigate. And um, I had a big infestation of something called a peach twig borer that I had to treat. Um, so yeah, I've just been farming, honestly. And it, it's been kind of cool because I, I work with a lot of growers at scale outside um, that are doing an acre um, or a half acre in a, in a big greenhouse or something. And so it's, it's good for me to actually execute the tractor technique. And because a lot of farming, it's like, you, you know what you should do, but executing it is hard at scale. It's like, do I have the right piece of equipment? What are the considerations? Um, what are the costs? And so it's good to like farm what feels like on a fairly large scale, just because it really kind of hones my technique. And I also put in uh, a, a chemigation valve. So at that pump station, I can be injecting whatever I want, whether it's a compost tea or a compost extract or soluble nutrients. Um, but I, I haven't just done a, my first injection yet. Like a Venturi injector or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to that. Um, it's like this giant steel thing. So it's a little different than like a Mazzy injector, but it's, it's more like commercial scale. Sure. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's what awesome. I mean, we've, we've been doing a bunch of systems like that. Um, sure. I wish we'd connected more a little bit the, at the beginning of the season on this because we have, we're doing a lot of those kind of larger, uh, I mean, we have, man, I just, we just put in a system that it runs off a 60 horsepower pump man. and they're Whoa. like they're running massive amounts of water through some of these Whoa. Uh, outdoor systems, um, you know, 400, 500 gallons a minute. Is that uh, on the front range you're doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and we're, and then we're doing other ones, you know, around, like we've done a bunch of out in Michigan, like just straight up cannabis facilities that are just outdoor. We've done a couple of multi-acre ones in New Mexico just in the last month or two. Um, and again, they're just, they're just big electric pumps uh, with a lot of drip irrigation and, um, or in some, you know, there's overhead stuff for cover crop applications too. Yeah, I had no idea you guys designed systems that big. Absolutely. It's really what we've been, that's what I was kind of saying. We've been just following what the demand is out there. And we've got started with the blue mat stuff and kind of like basic drip irrigation. That's my background too, is in, in drip irrigation. And, um, you know, I came to work here at Sustainable Village and then learned about blue mats and how they worked. And we started designing the blue mat systems. But uh, yeah, we've really, we've been working with a ton of the local kind of small scale market gardens on the front range here in the Boulder area. Um, doing some, and, and, and big, there's, there's some awesome like uh, permaculture designers out here now that have really taken off uh, this guy, Avery Ellis and, um, yeah. and uh, uh, Nick DiDomenico. He's got that uh, drylands arcoecology research program at Elk Run Farm. And those guys are, they're just, they're doing some great stuff and really big projects. And we've kind of stepped in and done a lot of the irrigation work 
work for those guys. Gosh, you, your, your business is, is expanding rapidly. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, well, it's sprawling. Let's let's call it that, <laughs> you know, so we got our hands in a bunch of different stuff, but yeah, we, um, we, we really have stepped up our ability to, um, you know, design and supply these kind of systems and then manage the, you, you know, kind of help with the, the project management with the install piece of it too. We don't actually put our hands on it um, once it gets out to the field, but. Um, so one thing I've been thinking a lot about this year that Matt and I discussed a little bit yesterday is just, well, I want to say cover cropping, but the, the topic is a little bigger because it's, yeah. it's essentially like my goal. I have it written down for my farm agronomically is to is to treat my farm like a massive solar panel and capture every single photon I possibly can with a plant. Because to me, that's how I build fertility and build long-term uh, soil health and farm health. And so, you know, intuitively it's like, okay. And, and I think there's a lot of um, philosophy around like weeds are, weeds are fine, especially in the permaculture community, like weeds are good. Like they're a successional thing. Um, I think there's a lot of philosophy in the cannabis industry, especially in the living soil community around like cover cropping, um, in pots and in beds and in indoors. And I, it's, it's this interesting thing because I'm so into cover cropping. I've been doing it for years now. And at the same time, like there are these production trade-offs that I feel like it's really important to be aware of. And I've learned this year in a big way. So for example, I, pl I planted my peach trees and at the last minute I decided to go with landscape fabric, just two feet on each side of the tree. And I got to say, if I hadn't done that, my trees would be half the size right now. And I probably would, ha I'd probably have like dead, dead trees out there. Um, because at scale, I wouldn't have been able to control the weeds and organically you can use, you can smother them with the fabric. You can use fire, you can use cultivation and that's about it. Yeah. And the cultivation tools don't really exist for organic orchards to cultivate the weeds. And have you used vinegar? Been, what, what were you going to say? Have you used vinegar? So or vinegar, like some, some sort of like, you know. I have used and on certain weeds it's effective, but on some, I mean like some vigorous weeds in the West just don't even care. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's agricultural vinegar. There are organic herbicides, things like weed slayer, which is really effective. But when it comes to like gra vigorous grasses and mallow, like it's just, and peach trees, they come bare root and they're so sensitive. I mean, if you think about like a, a cannabis clone, like you just don't want competitive pressure of any kind at scale when you're producing. And so anyway, I've been thinking a lot about um, competition and when plants are, are um, I don't want to use like synergistic and when they're benefiting one another and when they're, they're competitive. And my belief, at least my mindset right now is in year one with peach trees and then week one or week two with cannabis plants, like you just don't want pressure of any kind. And I've done some side by sides and it's the, the it's just clear kind of the difference. So that's one thing I've been thinking about. Yeah. They, cover crops can sometimes be a detriment and it's one of those things where like it, the grasses will draw down a lot of potassium and if you have a ton of grass in your container and and the the plant is only i don't know six inches when you transplant it that's a lot of nutrition that that cover is going to pull out and hold in living tissue until it decomposes and leaches back into the soil Mm -hmm. And you'll see, yeah, we, we talked about um, cover crops. We'll see cover crops in containers and they're allowed to grow to a point where they're setting seed. And that that's another huge drawback from available nutrition in the container that would normally go to the cannabis. I also think that it's just something to mention for people like clover and any nitrogen fixer doesn't release nitrogen until it dies. So like when it's growing, it's not releasing nitrogen to your soil until it's terminated. So I see that all the time. And I, 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 again, like it's stuck in my head where I'm like, oh, it's clover, it's building soil. It's like, no, it's not building soil until it either sloughs off a root or it is terminated. So, yeah. as in, and, and to your point in terms of potassium, like 
I've sat there in my garden and really thought about this and been like, why are the weeds affecting the crop or why are, you know, whatever, call it a weed, call it a cover crop. What, it, why are, why is the competitive pressure affecting that crop so heavily? And I'm like, I don't think it's moisture. I don't think it's nutrients. And I, I came across a study where plants, and this is obvious, we're oversimplifying with water and nutrients, but like there are wave, there are, I think it was infrared. There's some kind of wavelength where plants actually can sense competitive pressure through this, this certain wavelength and essentially go into a uh, systemic response, like a, a systemic immune response where they put their resources and put their photosynthetic assimilants into protecting itself from a weed pressure, similar to if there was a pest pressure or a disease pressure. Um, and then the, the second part of that story is as I'm, as I'm going through this in my head and thinking about weed pressure, I get hit by this this peach twig borer. And what it would do is it would eat one apical meristem per night. So I go out there and I see like the, the top shoots of about five or 10 trees were black. And I'm like, okay, don't freak out. Just observe, you know, like step one is observe. So I go out the next day, it's double. So I'm starting to freak out and I freaked out immediately. And by day three, I go out there and I'm like, I need to take action. This thing is literally taking one new shoot a day. And what's interesting is the trees at that point had like 50 shoots. So you'd think that if you were to prune two or three shoots off that tree, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have a big effect. The tree wouldn't care. It would just push out more. And this is the same with cannabis. You'd go, you'd go top the plants. You can cut them like crazy. But there's a difference between a biological pest and pruners. Because when, when the plant senses pest pressure, it has this entire physiological response that totally changes the the movement of energy around that plant and total and so all the all the peach trees went limp like they they went limp within like four days and it, i had this realization like wow they're so intelligent in terms of understanding what is is hitting them if it's if it's a pest or a disease versus if it's a you know a pruner so i've just been yeah. thinking stuff like that just bigger concepts around physiology totally yeah and to, to go back to the conversation around watering, in my opinion, in, in establishing an orchard in vegetable production, I keep, I keep coming back to the same lesson, which is soil moisture is the most important thing to manage as a, as a grower of any, of any crop. I think soil moisture is like, it's everything. And I'm a nutrition guy. I write a lot of soil recommendations. That's super important. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're not irrigating well. So I've, I've just been obsessing. I mean, I, I, I amended my soil so well and I put in manure and I, I was like, I did it in my opinion, as far as I could have gone But at the end of the day, it's all about moisture management. Yeah, it's critical. It's critical. And it's becoming more and more critical too, man, with like all the, you know, environmental pressures we're seeing too. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if, if anyone's in the arid West, west of the Mississippi, like the Colorado River Basin essentially is about to change dramatically. Like the, the federal government just mandated, the Bureau of Reclamation just mandated that the upper Colorado River Basin states cut their water use by something like 4 million acre feet, which is like a massive percentage of the total water. Yeah. And so whatever's going to happen, it's going to, it's going to be different. And I think that um, efficiency. I think there's two solutions. One is a, a market for water. It's like demand management where farmers can opt to optionally sell or lease their water rights temporarily. But the flip side of that is efficiency. Like everyone just needs to use less water. And in my totally. opinion, it's totally possible. Yeah. With, with the tensiometers like that, that's going to come into play more now, especially in places that are limited in their water use. And if you have these sensors and you know exactly how much water your field is losing, you like there's people that flood irrigate and when your when your soil gets dry you flood it it resaturates then it gets dry again but in that in that flooding event there's excess and if you're trying to save water that excess might be an additional irrigation event yeah or or a large well and, and it's like we talk about water savings and that's a that's like a, a major macro issue but at the end of the day the crop health 
like the argument for saving water to me is it's like, actually, no, if you irrigate efficiently and well, like you, your crops are better, you get higher yield, you get, you know, healthier plants. And yeah, in the process you save water. And I think the pitch to growers is, is crop health, not like save water and sell it back to the government. That doesn't fly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true, right? Like that's how you incentivize people is uh, uh, it's, this is like, you know, this is, this is going to benefit you as an individual, but, um, but there is, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in more efficient irrigation. You know, we talked about that NRCS grant that you got, uh, Brian, um, the, uh, you know, the big thing with them is increasing. Con- so they're into conservation, right? They're con- it's conservation as that's the C part of it. And they, um, so one of the big ways that we work with them is transitioning flood irrigation into hose reel applications. So these big Kifco reels that we do, and that's most of the big high flow stuff we do where, where we're doing hundreds of gallons a minute and stuff. But so these basically essentially large sprinklers that go out in fields and water, you know, acres at a time. And, um, you know, what, what I've kind of learned in working with those machines is you have flood irrigation and flood irrigation is, you know, that's like what, that's like the agricultural revolution, right? Like, or, I mean, the, that's like what uh, allowed mm-hmm. uh, humans to start cultivating crops was start start moving water around via gravity and, and watering yeah. large fields. So, I mean, we like all we owe, you know, everything to flood irrigation because that was the original irrigation. Um, but now, at this point in the game, we have to we can't we can't be so you know stone age about it. And we have to we have to look at like what's the most you know cost, what's the what's the what's the lowest uh, kind of energy input uh, you know footprint we're looking at when we irrigate our fields, and the uh, the you know one of the big problems with flood irrigation these days is it you guys kind of hit it. There's that runoff that happens. You, know, you start watering one end of the field and it pushes. Yeah. It takes hours and hours to get down to the far end of the field, and by that time you've you've pushed a lot of the fertility out of that top layer of your soil too. So yeah. like that excess watering is pushing a, a lot of the um, the nutrients out of that. Out of, and, you, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this. You guys know this stuff better than I do. And so just just moving from like an overhead big sprinkler kind of system uh, from flood irrigation, that's like a 50 percent increase in efficiency for water. So we're all of a sudden using like 50 percent less water to irrigate the field and improving soil fertility at the same time. Um and that's and like that in particular is uh, an application that if anybody out there listening has a farm right now and you guys flood irrigate, like you can call up your local NRCS branch and you'll probably get a grant. Yeah, you can get a I mean, I got I got a lot of money. Yeah. And no, yeah. I mean like the the like the projects that are coming in off this stuff. And you know, sometimes they'll pay for 60% or 80%. Right. But depending yeah. if it's like a historically underfunded or under like resourced population. They'll give you 110 percent. Like they'll give a little extra too, yeah. you know, to help with some things. So, and you don't even have to be a commercial business uh, for these NRCS grants too. You can be, a, you know, just like a, a you have your private farmer ranch too. Um, but so moving from flood irrigation to overhead applic, you know, irrigation, that qualifies you for for federal funding through the USDA. Um, so the the to your, I love that point on on so. The reason they're doing this is they're act well in my area is they're trying to reduce salinity in the Colorado River because when yeah. you flood, to your pushing point, pushing all that salt right down, you take the all the salts, yeah, mineral salts, fertilizer salts, just salinity of the Western United States, and it and it leaches, but it also runs off, and it always ends up in the river, and all the native species were dying because all the 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 river was becoming so saline, but more specifically. I can drive around and I can see fields where at the bottom of the field, it's white, like crusty white. Oh yeah. It's just sure. taking salts and moving them down to bring it back to cannabis and soilless media, by the way, another cool thing about blue mats and just efficient irrigation in general is a lot of these nutrients are really soluble. So like, you know, there, you can totally have a system where you're watering to runoff and you're wanting nutrients to move through. But in general, in a living organic soil system, I'm a huge fan of trying not to leach nutrients. So really efficient irrigation, if you're not ha- constantly having runoff out of the bottom of your beds or pots is, is a huge benefit. 
I consistently see nitrogen, potassium, and manganese as low after you run a cycle. I mean, those are the first three. Calcium can be low. Any nutrient can be low. But those three are always really low. And I've thought about it. And of course, the plant is taking up, you know, three, well, anywhere from like two to 5% potassium. So that's a lot. But I think a lot of it's actually just leaching out in, in inefficient systems. Same with manganese. I think those are very mobile nutrients. Same with nitrogen or nitrate specifically. They're mobile and I think they just get flushed out. So I think people don't think about like when it comes to irrigation technique, how you can lose nutrients so easily. Yeah. yeah. When that clicked for me, that whole thing about flood irrigation, pushing the salt content down uh, out of that upper surface like that, it was just... I mean, it makes so much sense. It's, again, like flood irrigation seems elegant, simple. It's gravity fed. There's, you know, you're not spending energy to run pumps or, or anything like that to pressurize the water. But uh, yeah, when you look at it as like kind of like what's the net gain or what's the net benefit compared to other techniques, it's kind of surprising. Just totally. It's, it's, it is counterintuitive because it, it's like installing a big pump and using a lot of electricity comes from coal to run my, it's, it's like, is it? Yeah. Another no, thing. that's a real thing. That's a real thing. Like I, I know they study that in California a lot because there's tons of drip irrigation in the row crop applications out there and the energy needed to pressurize all those lines. That's a significant amount of, of electricity that needs to be generated. And it's usually being generated through some sort of fossil fuel burning process. Um, so again, what's the, like, where do we offset? Do we offset it by, you know, using too much, like, do we want to save water or do we want to like, you know, burn fossil fuels? Well, it's possible to do both. Yeah, you know, and that's Agreed. what I'm kind of doing. I'm that's kind of getting my yeah. my year long usage, and then I'm going to get solar and finance it with a loan. And yeah, no, know. I mean that's and that you know, like the stuff we see, the most elegant systems I see are like, you know, in the hillsides, like the hillside gar cannabis gardens that we see, like some of the bigger ones even too. They'll have their like irrigation pond somewhere, and then they'll have whatever ten thousand gallons or thirty thousand gallons worth of storage on top of a hill, and they've got a solar powered pump that, you know, is set on a float valve, you know, with a range or something. So it, when the, when their tanks drop to a certain level, the pump kicks on and tops off these tanks at the top of a hill uh, with solar energy. And then you have gravity feed that comes down. And, you know, depending on how much pressure you have, like with a blue mat system, you have 15 PSI is all you need. I mean, you could do this with 30. Totally. Feet. Um, but, you know, if you've got 150 feet ahead, you can run drip irrigation stuff too. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, again, those are the most elegant systems I've seen. That small solar pump that keeps a gravity tank fed at the top of a hill where you're basically, you're, you have a net zero energy cost for irrigating your plants in the most efficient way possible. So hats off to those folks doing that one. And yeah. huge, huge thing for low PSI systems. Fun, yeah. Real quick story. First time I used blue mats was in 2014. Yeah, so by the way, Brian was one of the people that helped us uh, pioneer the use of, of the blue soak. Yeah. Technology. Yeah. yeah. Saw a question about that earlier on. Um, one, one of these guys popped up in the comments, Chris Bierman. I saw, I saw your comments. You guys have some good questions, man. I'd like to answer them all, but the, uh, uh, yeah, Bryant was one of the first people to help us, uh, R and D, uh, blue soak, uh, back in the day. Yeah. Thanks for the shout out. I, yeah. so I was out, I was growing out at Boulder Reservoir. And I had a, I, actually, I can admit this now because it's far enough away. Really yeah, yeah. I had plants all around the, the reservoir. In the, the really? Kind of yeah. Space. Oh yeah. We used to go skinny dipping back there when I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I was, I got a 275 gallon tote and I knew that I only needed like three or four PSI or whatever the blue mats required. So I lift, I did the math and I lifted a 275 gallon tote on pallets just high enough so I could have the, the and it was like, wow, I don't need that much gravity to run these things. So you were pulling water out of like with like a little battery pump or like a solar pump or something out of Boulder Reservoir to fill this thing up or what? I was, well, okay. And those plants, I had a five gallon bucket with it hung up in a tree. Uh -huh. But but this was the, I was using these just for experimental like raised beds for my vegetable yeah. insulation company. And so I was, I was like pumping water into the, the tow from a well. Okay. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah. And so it was like pretty, it was a pretty like old school setup. Didn't work that well, but. Um, this wasn't visible from Boulder, was it? Not from like downtown Boulder, but I mean, it Boulder was on the right hill. 
Chrysler. Yeah, like it's right there. It's just if you got up on the right hill, you could see the plants, but it was like you know, it was hidden. Yeah. Should should we cover a little bit of like field prep? I know we're not. Brian and I talked about topics to cover after talking about irrigation and steering and whatnot, but I don't think we're going to be able to cover all of them. You know, I think, I think we should we should schedule another one of these. As well. uh, yeah, we could. We'll cover actually instead of field prep. I feel like you should just chat briefly, Matt, on um, hop latent viroid. Yeah. So yeah, one of the things that you and I talked about was remediating spent media or I sh yeah soil. So like these lighter style soils. And you have a, a lot of people will let in, in larger volumes, they'll let the stocks rot they'll, or they'll pull them up and, and re, re amend and reset. But hop latent virus is, is a pretty serious problem. And it's very likely that it's residing in the root system. Um, hops are a, a rhizome uh, generating species. And it, it may be the case. I was talking with a lab di director out, out east that does uh, screening for hop latent, and one of the things, um, one of the things that they speculated was that it transitioned into cannabis from these these hop growing regions. Like in in Oregon, the Willamette Valley is full of hops, and then Oregon started growing a bunch of hemp, and that was right around the time where people started seeing this viroid pop up, or it might have been a little bit earlier. Um, so if you have a contaminated plant and there are, there are a lot of plants that are positive, but they're asymptomatic. So you could plant one strain, run that crop. It, it might come out fine or relatively, and then plant an another plant in there. And there's the potential for transfer into that plant. So that becomes a serious problem for these people that want to reuse their, their soil year to year. It, it, there's some guys that are on like the 30th cycle. Um, and it's, it, it's a pretty, like, it's a pretty durable molecule. Um, the, the last thing that I was told was that, it, so it's a single stranded RNA viroid doesn't have a capsid, but it, it can, he was, this guy was saying that it has a confirmation where it folds and it makes it not e as easily degradable by RNA aces. Uh, compared to other viroids that would hang out in in the soil, so it has a potential to to linger for a while. I mean, the stuff isopropyl doesn't destroy it. People have to use they have to use bleach on their on their utensils to destroy it. So, how do you identify it? Uh, what's that? How do you identify it? Oh, they they do PCR testing. Oh, as far as the sim the symptoms in the plant or the, yeah, like the lab. Sent, have you sent your plants to a lab? I did recently. Yeah, and there's so there are limitations to it, that dark art nursery. Yeah, so that's th these are the first guys that started publishing um, on hop latent. But there are limitations to PCR technology in detecting viruses or viroids. What they have to do is they they extract a sample. They run, they run a cycle, and the the, the primer um, or the the, uh, the sample gets detected and amplified. And every cycle, there is there's a chance to pick up uh, a detectable level of whatever you're looking for. So the the cycle threshold is is important in these tests. And some of the positive tests could be a cycle threshold of 40, meaning they ran it, they ran the cycle 40 times and a detectable level came up in the analysis. And that could be a false positive. Right. Um, but yeah, the, I, I had one out of five plants um, test positive at a cycle threshold of like 39 or something like that. And, and you have to interpret. Yeah. And they, the, the guy that runs the lab was, was very clear that this is, um, if it were a cycle threshold of 20, it's, it's, you'll see symptoms in those plants. There, there'll be, there'll be dudded plants. Um, but when it gets up to around 40, who knows, the guy that gave me the, the clone has had that, that plant test negative before. So it's probably, it's probably just a false positive, but if you submit an analysis, if you submit your plants to some of these labs and they, they should give you a, a, a cycle threshold value. And if it's somewhere around, 10 or 20, you're, you're very likely positive. 
-hmm. And I would start thinking about whether or not you want to cultivate in that soil or start fresh with tissue culture plants. What's the lab? Uh, the lab out east is, uh, I, have to, I have to check, Terminus Bio, pretty sure. They're, they're, not, they're not really, they're, they're a newer company. I don't think they're like, they're, they're wanting a, like a large influx of, of people right now. Um, but they, uh, there's, other, there's other companies, uh, Toomey. T-U-M-I out in, out in Oregon. And I'm not familiar with the California labs because I, I don't, I've never lived down there and I don't use them as much, but another good resource is medical genomics. They're a, a company that makes the plates um, to, to plate the samples and run through the detection machine. And they also test for cannabis cryptic virus and, I can't remember. There's a third virus that they, they sell a test for. It's a, it's a complete package test. But you'll find that complete package test through medical genomics will be a little bit more expensive. It'll be around $100, $120. And often labs that are testing for just top latent will charge around 25 Do you have any lab suggestions for disease, like fungal and bacterial disease? OSU. I, I mean, I, it's been a long time. Um, but when we were trying to figure out there was dudding was a hot topic on the grow forums years ago, and there was a lot of speculation about a virus. Some were thinking that it was just a plant succumbing to something like rhizoctonia or alternaria, some other fungal pathogen. Um, I also think that endophytes are something that pe people should be thinking about because there's dozens of different species, not, not just bacteria, but fungi and actinomycetes that can get into the plant. And often in a field setting, the plant will be healthy. Like this, you know, it'll grow normally. It'll, it'll produce flowers normally. The branches will be sturdy. You can't break them off like you, like you can on a dud, but it'll have something in it. And if you, do, if you don't do a meristem culture in, in tissue culture, say you take a, a clone or like a slightly larger piece that has vascular tissue, that that organism will come out on the plate and it'll grow in the petri dish and you'll see you'll see mold or you'll see like a bacterial slime and that's very likely the endophyte that's in the plant. Hmm. So you, I, there there are ways to address that too. Like if if they're taking meristem tissue, they're not removing any vascular tissue, and a lot of these things are are not present in that that very small piece of meristem. Um, but if you want to improve, like the likelihood of that an endophyte is not going to be carried over into, um, into your clone, there's things like calcium hypochlorite. It, you don't have to use bleach, bleach is sodium hypochlorite and calcium will introduce chlorine into whatever you're soaking your clone in, and, but also calcium, which is a nutrient. And you can get, sodium. yeah, that's, that's in pool, pool shock. You can make your own stock solutions of that. Hmm. And, and that, that, that'll, that'll, get, that'll get into endophytes you're saying like that's it, when you make that cut that'll blast them yeah and I, the 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 method is um uh there this is this is not like this is stuff you can search search on uh forums and and other people have, have been using uh pool shock for a long time to uh maintain like a, a more sterile reservoir in their cloner hmm but also you can soak clones in it. You just have to be, you have to be careful. You can't go too high in the chlorine. Interesting. Yeah. It's a, it's a big issue. I hear about it all the time and yeah. I'm constantly presented pictures of sick plants. And I, it's like with a picture alone, it's so hard because it's like, usually I can kind of assess whether it's nutritional or disease related and, if I don't believe it's nutritional, I'll tell a grower that. And then the obvious next question is, well, okay, how do I figure this out? And I, I rarely have a good answer in terms of like a good testing lab. I usually just say, reach out to your local university extension and tell them it's hemp and try to find that pathology lab that'll test it in your state. But yeah. I wish I had a go-to lab like Logan Labs for nutrition. I wish I had that for disease and I, I don't. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just... 
it, often you'll do a Google search and it, you won't easily find the right lab. You'll come, you'll come up with, uh, like I didn't find this tissue, this tissue culture lab on a Google search. I had to get it referenced to me by someone else. And it was an hour and a half south of me in Massachusetts. Hmm. And it didn't, it didn't come up on a Google, on a Google search. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I guess the best thing that I could provide is for, for stuff like endophytes and not hot blatant is ag extensions. And, but, the, but there are good labs that'll test for hot blatant and they're using, um, they're either using medical genomics, medicinal genomics plates, or their own protocols. Good information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you so guys want to uh, take any questions or anything like that? From I know we got about a hundred people listening right now, or so. And sure. Yeah, and I also want to just kind of be respectful of everybody's time, as well. Yeah, I'm gonna have to roll out soon, but if there's any last questions, I'm I'm happy to stick around. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I had one to start while I scroll around. Um, when plants get to the point of wilting, how detrimental to, is that to crop steering? And is that ever beneficial? If so, when? And what would be the remedy if it's a negative, uh, if it's just too bad for them, like really letting them get to the point of wilt? Would you kind of oversaturate them next, give them a little runoff? Yeah. I, well, if there's permanent wilt point and that's, that's the point where you'll never recover the plant. And I can't say exactly like the amount of moisture left in a soil is going to like the permanent wilt point changes for different soil types. So when you get close to it, the, the plants will wilt and you, you'll be able to recover them with an irrigation event. Uh, but the way they determine permanent wilt point for a, for a soil type is they, they put a plant in a container and they cap it and they, they leave it out in the sun or the greenhouse or whatever, and it, it'll wilt and then they'll pull it out and put it in a, a, hu a very humid room and it'll recover. And then they'll do the same thing. They'll put it back in the sun and, it, and it'll wilt. And at the point it doesn't recover, they can measure that, that soil moisture and they'll know what what soil moisture level is the permanent will point. Um, but in most cases, like, unless you forget your plants and you walk out for like a week or so, um, if you go into a grow room the next day and, and the plants are wilting, they'll recover. My, my answer to that is like, you, I, I don't think you want your plants to wilt. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. And so like, <laughs> if, you, if they're wilting, your dry back was too big. Yeah. You don't want to do I, that. I personally think crop steering and, and, Again, this is just sort of my, I don't, I don't think this is, I guess, Matt, disagree if you want, but like, I think it's subtle. I don't think it's anything super dramatic. I think crop steering, you want to start with subtle changes, nothing dramatic where your plants go limp. Yeah. I mean, really, most people can do more damage than good by overwatering or underwatering. Them. And same with light intensity, same with EC, same with C. I mean, it's like you can... It's not, it's not, it's definitely not for the casual grower. It's not for anybody that's, that's doing it um, in any, with any kind of like permaculture vibe or, or, you know, hobbyists or anything like that. The, the, the data points you need are very specific and, you know, overwatering is going to do tons of damage that you'll never even see. All you'll see is, you know, lack in yield. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the same with the underwatering. Uh, so, Main, yeah. And that's and that's the argument for that maintaining a static moisture level, right? Yeah, or keeping I, and, a narrow band in your in your fluctuation. I think it's important to say like this is an advanced technique. Matt's an advanced grower. He has like his environmental conditions dialed in. He's he has multiple rounds under his belt. I think yeah. I think it's better. Like I mean, for example, what I'm doing, it's like I think most of the time it's better to just maintain good soil hydration. Um, until you're very comfortable messing right. with things. And I guess the, the main point that I want people to take, take away from what we discussed in the beginning of the video, as far as like this light version of steering is that you don't, you don't have to approach that, that near wilt dry back. You can get, you can get the effect of, of steering a plant with these milder dry backs. Yes, definitely. And, and, and the degree of, you know, of, of the effect that you get 
it just depends on how how much you you dial the the blue mat back and, and and it's it's also not just blue mats like people ask me all the time like my plants are just in veg mode like i really want them to to, to be faster into flower i yeah. want them to start stacking i want them you know and my first thought is like yeah you toggle the water a little bit pull back you know if if and with blue mats, it's a little trickier because it's a again to me it's a, there's a little paradox there that like Matt explained how to get around it, but um, I think the principle is what's important. Right. I I also think that there's there's it, the drybacks are are better when your your plants going into flower. There's there's a huge need for calcium, and calcium moves into the plant uh, with water. Yep. Totally. So if they're if they're drinking more. In the beginning of flower, they're uptaking more calcium. Absolutely, and that's that's critical because it, it's it's at that point where they're the first bracts that are forming on each node as it as it starts to form the stack. Those those first floral bracts are going to be at the interior of the flower when the flower is mature, and if they're formed if they're formed well if they're made with like sturdy cell walls, they're going to be more resilient to things like fungal pathogens or yeah like. If you, if you say if you have a a high humidity event like later in the flower, yeah, you're, they're more likely to get uh, botrytis if they they weren't formed with like a good amount of calcium. Totally, good point. Here's another one that uh, I think is good for you guys. What is the benefit of blue soak over drip tape? It seems like it would be hard to water in with the sensitivity of the blue soak. Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump on this one real quick that, you know, blue soak is a soaker hose. It's made out of Tyvek like material. It's like a medical grade Tyvek type material. And we use it a lot with the blue mats. And um, uh, we have like a newer version that's come out in the last year or so. Uh, anyways, the, the main difference here is flow rate we're looking at. So uh, drip tape or, or uh, is, you know, either there's lots of different kinds, there's thin wall, there's heavy wall, but they all have like, it's like black extruded poly tubing that has emitters every so often, whether it's six inches, 12 inches, 24, 48 inches, whatever the spacing is, there's an emitter, you know, every so often. And they can either be comp pressure compensating or non-pressure compensating. Um, but they all need a certain amount of pressure and flow to give uniform distribution in that in that uh, <clears throat> soaker hose in the sorry the the drip tape, uh, whereas the blue soak, you know we can operate that down to like one psi and still get uniform distribution of water. So that works really great with the blue mats, which are on a very low pressure system. Maybe they're on gravity. Uh, the amount of water that's coming like through this little small three millimeter line is is pretty low. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's the it's the speed at which we water. So uh, if we're watering slower, we're generally getting, uh, <clears throat> well, it kind of depends on some different strategies, but overall slow kind of watering where we're just sort of topping off the moisture content in the soil is, uh, is the preferred technique. And we're able to do that with the blue soak with uh, drip tape. We have to water a little bit heavier and faster, um, <clears throat> Uh, not too much faster. It's not like flow irrigation or overhead watering, but it's uh, it's a little it's a little higher, and we can't do that with the blue mats uh, because of the uh, pressure and flow require uh, <clears throat> requirements of of those products. So those require like ten psi and and whatever the flow rate of uh, of the tape is. Does that kind of cover that? Yeah. Yeah. Please, Brian, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. I see a lot of both. I see big commercial operations in pots. I feel like the trend has been pot size getting smaller. Um, and when that happens, my recommendation is, you know, I really, yeah, in my online course, I have a, a liquid organic program and, and the frequency is what I think should change. I think frequent feeding is important in smaller pot sizes. I think the trend is, no, I, I don't like track it super closely, but I, I feel like I write a lot of recommendations for pots mm -hmm. and um, it sort of, I feel like Tad at Kiss Organics has really uh, pushed beds. I love beds, but I think maybe for just logistical reasons, pots seem to be 
slightly more common. But that's just my gut. I'm not 100% sure. I don't have any data or anything on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that there are, there are successful large soil operations um, and there are unsuccessful ones. That, that it's, it's challenging to run larger volumes on a commercial scale. And if you have something change in your soil, in soil, when you're growing cannabis and you're, you're amending every three months, your soil's changing quite a bit. And it's not just the, it's not just the amount of potassium. It's like the, the physical structure, the density, growth. the poor space. Yeah. And this is like, I, sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse when I'm talking about what, um, what like these medias can, or these soils can change into. And that everyone's, there's a lot of people introducing worms and worms can eat all the peat and other stuff that's mixed in the soil and turn it into castings. Now, if 40% of your soil was peat after a year or two, it just depends on like how the rate at which it's progressing, but warmer, wet rooms, the, those worms will, will just rip through that peat, turn it into castings. And now you have a media that was, that is 40% castings roughly, or more if you had castings in the initial mix. Now, if you have a cannabis media that's half castings, it's like a density issue. If you, if you reach into your beds and you pull out a clump of soil and it's greasy to the touch, you're going to need a ton more calcium to flocculate that soil. You want or, it, yeah. Yeah. You want it to breathe. You want this. If the soil's breathing and the water's moving through it more efficiently, the roots are going to move through it more efficiently. Your plants are going to be healthier. Yeah, we're we're seeing. I definitely am seeing a slight as a trend uh, towards more. It's really like a size thing. I, I'm seeing with just to answer this the initial question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we've done. I mean, hundreds of these systems where they're you know one to four, you know, hundred foot by thirty foot greenhouses that have ninety foot long raised beds. You know, they those those grassroots living soil beds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sell those. We sold a ton of those. Those are, are a pretty cool product. Um, for if you if you want to put a, a raised bed in, um, but the la like last year and the year before that, those were just going out like gangbusters. We you know, so many people were putting those up. And I don't know. I mean, maybe there's just enough people that put those systems up and they're functional now. Yeah, I'm not. Like, I'm not knocking the the style yeah. at all. Yeah, no, I like it. I personally yeah. actually really like raised beds. I think it's a scale and in indoor versus outdoor greenhouse. Well, like we're this. seeing it. Yeah, I see it right around like, I don't know, maybe say ten thousand square feet of canopy or something like that. Like once, mm -hmm. you know, like these really massive things that are that are trying to do, um, you know, either they're going into native soil stuff and they're going to like drip irrigation right in the ground. Or if they want to go really big with an outdoor thing, or they have these, you know, these massive, uh, like acres and acres of greenhouses kind of applications, we're seeing people uh, doing these days. Um, I think with the small, I think small craft growers, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, small craft growers, those those are the guys that, uh, those are the people, you know, there's a lot of gals out there too, that are are really succeeding with those like raised bed, yeah. you know, greenhouse mixed light applications with, the, you know, with the living soil and the blue yeah. mats. And it's like, it's like this classic kind of look that there's lots of them out there. And I know a lot of them are being successful because they, they, they call me up and like add, they're adding another greenhouse or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think, they're, like producing, I think, well. I think they're producing like a, a level of uh, uh, quality you know, that's, that's above the rest, you know, and it like, you know, what's the price, what's the average pound of weed right now. Right. It's like, yeah, low, right. Maybe people are paying, you know, it depends on the state, but, dollars yeah. for them. And, and in that competitive market, there's always, there's always going to be, um, you know, a market for, for, for quality. So like that craft quality, that micro brewed, you know, beer or whatever, like that quality is always going to be there. And I think those are the, I, I don't know. I think that's still a really viable. Anybody that's like looking to get into like a craft license kind of application or is doing yeah. their own thing or whatever, like there's still, there's still room there to. There, to and I don't think there's one way to do it. And I also want to, that, that question to me, um, 
whoever asked it may be kind of like trying to figure out if they should do pots or beds. I don't think there's necessarily a right answer. I think it's about scale. It's about your own operation, it's about the entire context of how you're cultivating, what your market is. If you're trying to grow like a yeah. really, you know, bio, you've grown a biological system of very little soil um, with a lot of soil reuse. I mean, I think it, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it. I do think I will say that if you're in a small pot size like Matt, and you're doing it organically, you got to be ready. You got to have a really dialed in fertigation system. Um, yeah. A small pot doesn't matter if it's organic or not. You have to have a good fertigation system. Yeah. But in terms of organics, there's other elements because it's not, these products aren't technically soluble. So you have to have really good agitation in your mixed tanks. Um, just be prepared to, to be like a, a really, you're going to feed a lot. Right. In small yeah. pot. And, and you have to have a, you have to be ready for that. Um, and I think that has to kind of be your specialty. Like that, you know, I, I, that has to be your, your focus in terms of your, your management. So I think beds are a little more, um, they may not be more forgiving from a irrigation standpoint, but I just think from a, from a soil and an amendment standpoint, um, thanks for the comment on that, whoever that was, uh, the, I think that it, it, it's a good system um, for what Matt, what Michael's talking about, like mid scale, small scale. I think it's great. So yeah. it's just, it's just context specific. I don't think it's the right answer. Yeah, totally. I, and it's, it's, you're talking about lower soil volumes. They just, the EC in, in, in small volumes of soil can drop. If it's a three foot plant in a five gallon pot, totally crashing EC after a week, if you don't do anything, yeah, if you don't top dress or, or whatever. Um, cannabis is just a heavy feeding plant. Exactly. And the other and, thing is plant size, right? So like mm -hmm. it depends on how big you want your plants to get. And I, I personally think soil volume per plant is the, the most important metric that determines plant size. So yeah. if you're in a small, you're in a, a small greenhouse, then you, you want to, you want higher plant density, for example. So there's just so many variables. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right, right. Are you, uh, I, I want to ask a couple questions now. Yeah. Uh, are you guys are because we're kind of wrapping up here. I want to. I know we all got to finish here in the next few minutes. What are you doing? Um, are you still working with? Uh, are you still running your your educational program right now? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually doing soil doctor is very active. I talked a lot about my orchard, but still the majority of my time is spent on my business. Um, every day I'm writing a lot of soil recommendations and I'm doing a lot of tissue analysis. Um, the people I work with primarily do. Uh, ongoing soil testing and tissue testing simultaneously. And um, Ben and I, my employee Ben and I are constantly writing recommendations. We try to have 24 hour turnaround time. To answer your question on the course, the course is ongoing and people are signing up uh, sort of regularly. Unfortunately, I haven't really marketed it that well. Yeah. But I continue, I've just been silent and I, I'm developing a somewhat of a, a like, software where you can enter your own soil or tissue um, results and oh yeah someone's stanley is asking about it um essentially a soil amendment app and you can get and it's it's more than just the soil test results it, it asks for all kinds of details about your operation whether you're indoor you're outdoor how long the plants are in the soil the soil volume per plant um all of these different and then it spits out an immediate soil recommendation so i've been working on that heavily. Um, and in the process of developing that stripe robots somehow figured out that I was in the cannabis space and blocked me. So I had to remove my course from my website. So there is a direct link to the soil course that I'm still offering, but it's kind of hidden. So if anyone's interested, just send me an email. Um, so yeah, that's still going on. Where should they email you at? Bryant. B R Y A N T at soildoctorconsulting.com. You can also hit me up on Instagram. I haven't been active on that either, but I occasionally check the messages. Yeah. Matthew, you got you got your own program going on too, right, man? Yeah, I I mean my my original Instagram handle was more of a personal thing, and that the the first podcast that we did was li listed at as Oricron. And I started a new one for the business I set up in Vermont, and that's Rizo VT, Rizo with a Z. And I do a lot of the same things that Bryant does. He does quite a few more soil um, RXs than I do annually. Like I think maybe 
maybe more of his time is spent consulting. Um, but now we're both we're both kind of operating similar property sizes, and a, lo- a lot of my time is getting into managing that. Um, but I still do work with with clients. Yeah, yeah. Both these guys are tremendous resources. A lot of our clients work with them. Um, you know, so again, you can find Brian at on, a, on IG at the Soil Doctor, and uh, and, <clears throat> and Matthews at uh, Rizo V T R H I Z O V T. Um, since he just moved to Vermont. Cool. Yeah, setting up the homestead. I I almost don't have to irrigate. We we're getting so much rain in the summer. Wild. It's, yeah, it's it's crazy. That scares me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think of all that disease, man. No, yeah. If if you run dry in Colorado, Bryant, you can just you guys can just come to my commune. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be, have diverse communes all over the country. So. I'm coming to that commune. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, anybody needs any kind of irrigation system. Uh, of any sort, you know, we got it covered, you know, hit us up at sustainablevillage.com. You know, we do free quotes and designs. We'll send you like a really nice uh, <clears throat> drawing and a parts list and the whole thing. Um, and uh, yeah. So, and we're also at uh, on Instagram at blue mat watering systems. So if you're not checking that out already, check it out. Blue mat watering systems on Instagram or sustainablevillage.com. Cool. Man, guys, this was awesome. This is yeah. a good one. Yeah. And thanks, Matt. Yeah. It, it was uh it was just as fun as the last one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think, uh, I think we should do one in the next uh in the next couple months here for sure. Yeah, um, let's be in touch. A little downtime. Um Matt will be home with the baby. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to see some pictures of the first peaches that come out of the orchard. You know, it's, it's funny. I got I had one flower. This year. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, this one tree produced one flower. And I'm like, hmm. and, but I, I actually, well, I don't know if it was an accident or not, but I, it got pruned off. So yeah, maybe next year. And I'm going to have a big crop next year, as long as they don't freeze, as long as the, the blossoms don't freeze. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, thanks guys. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, Travis, for having us. Yeah, Travis, good to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Yeah, I appreciate all the knowledge and all the insight. And uh, thanks for emceeing and uh, making it real easy. I appreciate it. Shout you. out to Peter, too, man. You got a, a great platform here. So, yeah, we, we love it. Thank you. Thank you He's so smoking much. smoking weed on the beach right now. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get you guys on again uh, and continue the conversation. I think it'll happen. Yeah. Sure. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Take it easy. Yep.